Hello and welcome to the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today's episode is part of the SLP Spotlight series where I talk with SLPs in a variety of SLP positions and settings, doing things that we knew SLPs did, but also working in areas that we've never thought or heard of SLPs working in. It is amazing the opportunities these SLPs have taken and where their careers have gone. This is storytelling time. Welcome to this episode of The Missing Link for SLPs. I'm here with Michelle Linares, and she's got a wonderful angle to share with us today. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited you're here because we always chat before we get on our podcast, and I I ask just so everybody knows, the interviewee, what, if there's any specific questions they would like me to ask them. And, and Michelle, you've got a lot of, of, yes, you have some questions you definitely want me to ask, and we've got a neat episode planned today. So tell us who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, Let's see. I'm a speech language pathologist. I graduated back in 2005 and I'm located in the San Fernando Valley in Southern California um, so our catchment area is pretty large out here for the kind of population we see. I have a private practice. Um, we see all ages. So we jokingly say from womb to tomb. <laughs> you know, we see kids in the, in the Antelope Valley, in the Santa Clarita Valley, in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, Learning Grove has about 30 employees. We're a training site for about seven different universities. Um, and so uh, let's see. I used to teach at Cal State Northridge. I was a lecturer, so I I used to do general clinic there. So I'm really familiar with supervision and training beginning um, clinicians. Um, We also are a training site for SLIPAs in their SLIPA SLIPA program. Um, I'm active in the California Speech and Hearing Association. I'm actually the chair elect, so I'll be the chair next year. So it's been really nice to see, um, to work on the advocacy end. I'm you know, the chair of the advocacy committee, and we've been able to have a lot of dialogue with or try to influence legislation to help us. So it's been nice to see um, uh, how SLPs mobilize to make things better for us as a whole. I feel like um, at this stage in my in my personal career, I mean, as a therapist, I've treated in the hospitals um, and then opened my practice. Um, So I, you know, I'm comfortable with my treatment skills. Um, I'm getting more and more comfortable with my business skills, um, and I'm really enjoying this part of um, advocacy and working for the profession um, as a volunteer, but on a bigger whole to make things better for us. I'm happy to hear that. That's where I'm at in my career as well. Uh, This is me giving a legacy back to a career that's richly rewarded me. And I think that's why you and I, when we first connected, we were both like, yes, yes. There's a (laughs) wonderful side to being a speech pathologist, but there's also a very, I I say left brain side, a very business side. Now you've really grown your private practice. Uh, When did you open up? I opened up in 2007. um, And so that's when I was doing um, a contract that took me to people's homes And I actually opened my brick and mortar clinic in 2009. And so it was very shortly after I had graduated and finished my CF, I feel like. (laughs) Um, I don't know. I I ran into someone a long time ago at a conference and they said, I remember in grad school, you'd always say you'd open a private practice. And I said, I have no recollection of that. (laughs) Um, I I didn't intend, I think, to open a private practice. I definitely was. I mean, I was open to any possibility, but I was happy in the hospital's. I had just recently married, um, so, well, I guess we were past the newlywed, newlywed stage, but I was pregnant, and I had a little girl, um, and so what became difficult working in the hospital setting was leaving her um, and coming home, and she was either asleep or in someone else's care, and I was kind of, in the, I think it was probably a lot of postpartum stuff, but I felt like I was missing out on her almost immediately, and so I went back to my employer at the time, and I asked the hospital um, if I could go part-time. And I think that because I was green, they pushed back and they said, well, you know, this is a full-time position, so you have to pick. I didn't. I think that they didn't think I would pick to leave. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I just said, well, you know, you like how I work. And if I fall flat on my face, I will be back. 
Um, but you know, and I hope you take me, but I, I have to do this. I have to, I have to be with her. Um, and that's kind of how learning growth started. <laughs> it was very Forrest Gumpy. I felt like I just asked for it. And then all of a sudden it was happening. Everything was put in motion. I remember a woman gave me my first contract. Um, she, she reviewed my things, but I didn't go through some of the rigmarole that other people have talked to me that or their experience because she was um, also a mom. She was going to be going on maternity leave. She was clearing her desk. She asked me all the necessary questions, stamp, stamp, stamp. She's like, you have a contract. <laughs> I'm like, that's it, you know? So it was it, the, the beginning of it was definitely interesting. It, I don't know that even that experience um, prepared me for what um, procuring other contracts was going to be like, um, how careful I was going to have to be in, in reviewing them understanding that contracts are, are unilateral when they're offered to you and that you can have a say in how they're going to, yes. how they should be written. Yes. Um, also investing in uh, the proper teams of people, the proper professionals to actually review them. So spending the extra $500 for the attorney to look at it, you know, spending um, a, an hour of time with my CPA or my bookkeeper to say like, well, what do you think about this? You know? So, the beginning um, felt very easy, and um, I don't know that that I. It was easy. It was easy for me. <laughs> I think it's easy because you came from a place where you knew where you wanted to, what you wanted to do with your life. You wanted to be a speech pathologist, but your priority was being a mom, and yes. you made that happen. Which is one of the beautiful things about our careers. We can go and do what we want, but we do have to be brave and we do have to be smart. Yes. And, and I think that in my case, I'm a first generation American. My mom's from Mexico. My dad is from Peru. Um, they met here, you know, they, we grew up here. So, um, spent a lot of time like assimilating and, you know, everything was like, go USA. <laughs> and it, it was an interesting uh, thing for me because my mom's experience, when we talk about things, um, you know, she came from another country and so she didn't have, the help here that I was open to and being the daughter of immigrant parents, you always hear about how lucky you are. You speak the language. You're so lucky. You went to school here. You're so lucky. You have it, you know, easier than I did. And so I would say that that also translated into an incredible support group. You know, my mom, uh, my husband uh, and, and my mother-in-law, you know, everyone kind of rallied behind and just said, Oh, well, this is what Michelle's doing. And everyone kind of rolled up their sleeves and, picked up whatever slack I couldn't. So I, um, I think in that way, I was very fortunate as well because I wasn't, they didn't help me necessarily with the business side of things um, and making those decisions, but they helped me be in more than one place at once. <laughs> they helped me pick up, you know, um, or take the school at a child, you know, or if they were sick at night, you know, I, I have, I have a good support system. You know, I'll say that. Like I got an award at, Cal State Northridge for volunteer service and then another one um, through our alumni department for um, distinguished alum. And I remember thanking them and I realized like, but I, the reason I was able to be in all these places and do all the things that I did was I had someone at home. I knew my children were fine. I have two children now, you know, they were, they were good. Frank was going to bathe them. Frank is a nurse. He's my husband. And it's interesting how well you could do when you have the right people doing their their job too you know they were part of learning groves team but they're the unseen team you know <laughs> they, everybody kept themselves alive and well enough so that I could keep my focus on the other things that would pull my attention which was the business um, which in the beginning felt like it was a seven day a week job what words of advice do you have for the person who doesn't have such a support team how do they find one I would say um you know, you are your, if you are your brand, um, there's a couple of things that you, I would, ex, I would hope that you would refine and that's your ability to provide the service that you're saying that you're going to do. And when things get kind of complicated and muddled, you remember that that's what you do. You don't, you know, sell other products. You're not, you are a speech language pathologist. Um, and so that service, I think, um, that service side of it, you need to remember uh, what your mission is and stay true to those things. It's very easy to get pulled in other directions. I would say that um, you should have a vision for yourself that's 
um, bigger than you are now. Most people, I think, go in and say, it's just me. I don't want anything complicated. Um, but some of those decisions cost um, money down the line. You don't know where things are going to take you. So preparing yourself for growth, um, like one of the expensive mistakes I'd made was I started with paper pencil charting. And when I transitioned to using an EMR, which was a game changer and um, helped me grow and keep track of many things, um, be able to pull metrics. That also cost me a lot of money uh, when it was time to transition. Um, I feel like there was a lot of professionals in the beginning that were very sweet and well-intentioned, but they kind of pat you on the back and say like, well, you don't need to do all that. You don't need to go and be an S corp, you know, just be a, a sole proprietor for now and, and not having any reason as to why you choose that. Or, you know, just, just get yourself a little business account and put your money in there. I mean, some accountants would even tell you just to do like a cash accounting system versus like an accrual basis. All of those things may have saved me money in the beginning, I thought, but cost me tons of money down the line. Um, you know, having someone create books that are on a cool break basis, you know, going making enough money to go through your first audit, you know, DBS audit, all of those things all tied together. And so when I when I started, I think looking back, it was very easy to start my little practice with, you know, my my little file cabinet at home and, you know, my forms and I'd run to places and I'd fill out my soap notes and do my report. But there was such a bigger side to that. So if you're starting out, I would say talk to a CPA, talk to an, an, um, an attorney, talk to someone that has vision and can use their expertise to, to push your vision along. You would decide when you're ready to grow or not, but at least they will set you up along the way to be able to make the decisions when it's time to make them, you know, instead of just kind of going, well, you know, it's just this little thing. It's just me. Well, it's not a lemonade stand, you know, your private practice of one person or 30 people or 120 or a thousand people is still a practice that has to adhere to laws and regulations. It still has to adhere to HIPAA standards. It still, you know, has to pay taxes. It still has to go through financial reviews. It still has to do lots of things, um, even if it's just you by yourself. And I think that that's the reality or the, the part that we don't always um, get told. That's very true. That's very true. Tell us about your perspective of being a good employer. What are some things that you would like your employees to know from your perspective? Um, I think I was very proud. I still remember the day that I was able to offer them health insurance. Um, I didn't have to. I had 30 employees um, in California. Those are considered fringe benefits. Um, and not something that you have to offer. I don't, the only thing I have to offer is LA six days sick. Um, but I was able to um, offer them um, a 401k with a 4% match, which I know is even more valuable than health insurance because that's money you take with you. Um, I was able to offer them um, a cost share of health insurance. I was able to offer vacation um, when I ask them to work for me, I am able to give them the tools that they need so everyone gets a hotspot for internet and a, you know, a tablet to work on um, if they're going to be working remotely. Um, all of those things come out of cost. Um, so, and, and we train them. I train them every month. Um, I train them to be as good, if not better, as I am. And if they're met with a challenging case, I've often found the budget to send them for training to be able to service that one patient. Um, you know, because I know that investing in them is investing in the practice, is investing, you know, to people working at the top of their license. Um, but none of those things, um, you know, or I should say all of those things come at a cost. Um, and so staying competitive and understanding what, um, we get paid in the area and being able to come up with good compensation. Um, I'm, I'm very proud um, that, I've, that, I'm, that I'm trying to do right by my employees and give them what they need to be successful speech pathologists. Um, I also, um, something that my family has learned in terms of, of sacrificing my time is that I am available to them truly by text, email, phone call, um, whenever they need me. Um, and they're very respectful of my, of my time, but um, I am here to support them. I didn't put them out there to, to work and then get stuck. 
So even when I can't, I have friends that um, supervise and they will step in if I needed them to. Um, but I, I've always been able to meet that need. So I think being an employer, it matters. Um, their safety matters to me. If, you know, they're, that they're okay where they're going, the environments in which they work in. Um, you know, I, I always say we're a working family and there has to be um, healthy boundaries. I'm not interested in making anyone feel uncomfortable and get in their business and know things that I shouldn't. But if you're upset and your mother has passed away or your child is being bullied, I'm going to see that. We're in a health profession. And so, again, healthy boundaries. If they want to share those things, they can. But I know that that's going to impact how they're able to work. And maybe they need a mental health day that day. And maybe I'm going to have to step in and see their, their um, caseload for the day to give them that because that's the business side of it. We still have to cover all of those bills and to the patients, but I'm willing to do what I need to do to also ensure that they're um, happy and healthy and safe. Um, and I think that the employees that I've had with me for a long time, most of them do. We do have some that transition because of change of life, you know, or, or moving, um, or they wanted to get into like a, say like the medical side of it and they get a placement in a hospital. Like I totally understand that and respect that. I even had some employees open their own practices and you know, we work together as they transitioned out and they still call me for tips and things. Um, but those that have been with me for a long time, um, you know, I, I feel like they matter to me as much as serving the individuals that we give speech therapy to is also looking at my team, my staff and caring about um, who they are and what they need in their life at that moment. I mean, I can't solve every problem, but I definitely want them to feel like where they, when they go to work that I care about I care about them, you know, and I think that's what I mean, you have to decide. Do you want to employ people and do you want to carry the burden of, of that? You know, I talk a lot about um, people's best days when I, when I give this one talk about um, empathy and um, I learned it through my husband, who's a nurse and he, he trained um, a long time ago um, under very old school nurses, like with the little hats, you know, and he told me once, um, you know, Michelle, at bedside, when you see sick people, it's not their best day. So you have to treat them with the utmost respect. And I really internalized that one day because I thought, well, what's my best day look like? I'm healthy. I, I have the people around me that I love. I'm laughing. I, I picture that best day being um, calm and happy and, and good, right? Definitely not the day that you were told that your child has a speech delay or that mom can't swallow or they walk into your office and say, I think he has autism. You know, well, a lot of people that sit in front of me are there not on their best day. And while I can't fix everything, I can give them the, the assurance that I will do whatever I can within my scope to help what I can help and that I see them and that I'm with them. But that extends also to your employees because, you know, oftentimes an employee comes to you and doesn't um, say, good job, boss, or really, you're doing great today. They're going to sit in your office and say, like, I, I need this or I need that or I, I'm going to have to take a leave or, you know, my parents are sick or my husband, you know, has stopped working. Um, you know, I, my child uh, needs a computer for school and you have to be ready to listen to that also and understand what your role or your responsibility is or what you could do to aid or help if, if you can't, you know? And so um, when you sit in a position of leadership, you have to consider that the person in front of you, when they're coming with the request, it's something that you can't just ignore, you know? And I think that that's something that's not talked about enough. Um, by employers um, and employees, that relationship, the leadership, what's expected of them. I think um, culturally there's this um, impression that, you know, like the boss is like, you know, this backbreaker, or this person who only cares about bottom dollar, you know, and um, you have to care about keeping the lights on and being able to pay their payroll and pay the bills. And my staff will eat long before I do. You know, I always say that. <laughs> um, but you have to care too. We're in a care profession. So treating them, you know, not well, I think is not an option. Oh, I would totally agree with that. And in the settings where I've been, where I have felt valued and, and cared for and respected as an employee is where I want to give my very best to my employer. 
it sounds like what you're talking about is perspective taking. You're giving us your perspective as from both sides because you've seen both sides of employees where they've sat before you and have said, here's where I'm coming from and as an employee. And then you also are sharing with us where you come from as an employer, how you do have that bottom line. We do. I mean, I will say like uh, if somebody if somebody is not well and they have to take a leave, that's going to impact the whole team. Right. They're going to have to we're going to have to pick up their patient caseload. We're going to make sure we have to make sure that if we got to sign new patients for them, that we're meeting federal timeline, that we start them timely. You know, but when someone is looking at you and says, my mom has cancer, I have to fly back to wherever it is I have to go. Um, I can't say, oh, but wait, all of your patients and we're going to be out of compliance and you can't go and you have to stay. You have to, you have to be ready to say, okay, do what you need to do. And we have to also then on our side, make sure that we do what we need to do to keep that, that side open because get dinged enough, you won't get referrals. Um, don't follow through on patients and you have a bunch of complaints. They don't, you know, your referral sources don't always take the time to say like, oh, it was just that the practice was in transition or something happened. No, they're just saying, no, don't refer to them because right. they, you know, I've, I've had five patients already call to say that they're not coming, you know? And so that's what I mean. Like the, the needs of the business and the needs of your, um, your patients or clients, whatever setting you're in, don't stop, you know, that doesn't change. So if they can't meet that, um, that demand, you're going to have to be prepared to meet it for them. Right. And that's happened, you know. Right. But as the business leader, that's your job. That's your role. That's my role. And I will take it, you know. Um, and I don't want to, and I'm not there to burden them. I, you know, it's important that, you know, I don't, I don't lay that on them to be considerate. You know, if you've got this bigger life matter, I'm not going to come back to you and be like, oh, well, when are you coming back? You know, like those, this, this perspective that, you know, isn't helpful to anyone. Right. Um, but I think that those, you know, you have to be ready to step up and lead. Um, and, and, and there has been times when I've had to step up and lead and the, um, the slack of the person that I'm covering, maybe it wasn't because it was something so serious. It's not for me to judge. It's for me to just facilitate, you know? I like that. I like that perspective. How is your decision making influenced? Um, I think it's weighted. It, it, well, what kind of decision making um, were you thinking? Like in terms of patient care, in terms of um, employing people, or just in general? Do you mean like if I had to? In terms of employing people, um, I think that I look for something. There's this thing that you can't train. Like I can train anyone to be a speech pathologist or a speech pathology assistant, how to treat and how to duplicate the thing that I was doing in the room because it's a science and you could duplicate it. Right. So I can teach you the trade, that part. Um, I can't, um, if you're not in that stage in your life, um, where you're able to, um, perspective take, I can't train that. I can't train, um, if you're not like, it's, it's like character, right? Um, these aren't, this isn't like a deadline for, for school where you just have to get the report in or you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to get the B or the C or, or the fail on it if I can't get it in. These are people's lives. And so I look for someone, you know, who's committed to the profession, who's responsible, um, who cares about um, themselves. And, and it's, you have to make sometimes some decisions um, when you when you meet them only for the first time, you know, a resume could say one thing, um, but can they be with another person in a room for a bit? You know, you can't just try out people. So it's, it's, it's hard. So I will look at the, I will look at certain factors, you know, like um, I will ask things like, I, my practice is far from your home. How is that commute going to impact you? Are you okay with it? It's okay if they are or if they're not. I just want them to consider that, you know? I'm going to look at, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be practical. I guess that's, that's where I'm going to come at uh, my decision making. I'm going to look at it pragmatically and, and hope that it's going to be something that's mutually beneficial. So again, someone without a lot of experience, I got you covered. We will, we will work together. I can train you up. Yeah, I think it's this thing of, of, of character. Like, here's one. Here's, here's one that helped me once. Um, I had a young lady who came. 
um, and applied and they were from a clinic not too far away. And um, I said, okay, you know, I, I interviewed, I did the whole thing. Um, and then I, I said, so when can you start, you know? And she's like, well, you know, right away. I go, okay, but um, does your employer know that you're looking for um, an out, another position? Like, are you going to, do you need to give them time? I don't know what your rules are there, but I imagine you have a caseload for them and I'm willing to help you ease in to not put a burden on that clinic. We could talk about what that looks like too. Um, and, uh, you know, she was really thoughtful about, you know, when she took a step back and she really thought about it, you know, she came up with a plan so that she could finish out those that couldn't be replaced because she was, she had a specific language, um, the other ones that moved away. And then we slowly transitioned her over to our practice. And I thought I, for me, that showed a lot of, um, trust It showed character, it showed responsibility, um, I don't know. I just thought that that was a wonderful um, example of someone being thoughtful about those maybe two or three patients over there on that other, at that other clinic that we're going to go without because no one else spoke that language. Um, and so I just, that, that impressed upon me something really nice. Like I thought highly of her work ethic or her ability to see, you know, it would have been so easy for her just to say like, bye to the other clinic, start at this new one, train up, get her case, let it move on. Right. But she still, um, saw those two or three patients through and I thought that was great. She demonstrated integrity. That's great. And that's yeah. And those are things that a clinician comes with to wherever she is in her career, she brings those. Yeah, exactly. And that you can't you can't teach somebody that. You could ask it of them, but you can't you can't give them that. Yeah. You know, and I just thought that that was really a yeah. a great thing in her. Final question. What words of advice would you have to the newer speech pathologist who's starting out or transitioning in her career? Um, who's starting out in private practice or just in general? Just in general. Um, I would say invest in yourself. Um, it's a new kind of, the, the generationally, you know, I, I came to the field and I knew that this is the field I would do for the rest of my life. Um, I love that the newer generation sometimes has two or three careers <laughs> under their belt and they're young and they're trying different things. Um, but the same way that you would, um, learn something, I would say, build up your resume, invest in yourself. I mean, I wish that I had employers that could have paid for, um, different trainings that I needed that were very expensive, like hand and or prompt at the time, but I didn't wait. If I was interested at the time and that's what I had needed all those years ago to be better. I, I did it. Um, and I did it because I knew that um, that education piece um, was going to keep me dynamic, um, right. marketable, um, and capable of doing my craft, of doing what I set out to do. So don't be scared to invest in yourself. Don't be scared to give up, you know, what you think is giving up a weekend where you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. I've worked all week and now I have to go to this conference. Mm -hmm. You know, some, it's, it's a small sacrifice. Um, to make you better and it makes your life, your job, the, the trade, the thing that you're doing um, infinitely better, easier to do, the better you get at it. So don't be scared to invest in yourself. I think that would be a really a, a good solid goal for someone in their first year, their first two years. I, I resonate with that because I have students who come to me quite often and they're like, I want a career like you've had. I want to do this, this stuff, this exactly what you're doing. How do I do that? And I say, well, go take these courses, go do this, go do that. Cause you've got to set your resume apart from everybody else. But, but the resume it's, it's also for you. It's not to look good to other people and the employers, but it's also to feed that well, that not, knowledge, that curiosity that you have to move your career forward in the direction you want it to go. So I like those words, invest in yourself. Thank Excellent. you. I, I agree. Mike. Well, thank you for your time today. Tell us again where we can find you. Um, so again, my name is Michelle Linares. I am at The Learning Grove. So uh, we have Facebook, Instagram, and our website is www.thelearninggrove.org. Um, and on there is all of our contact information. And um, I am always happy to speak to uh, therapists in the field, uh, whether you're seasoned um, or you are brand new. Um, I'm happy to share uh, 
any bit of knowledge that I can. And so good luck in, in your careers. <laughs> you make the world a better place. Yes, absolutely. And all of this information will be in the show notes as well. So go find Michelle. I hope today's conversation has created some aha moments for you and motivated you to become a better SLP, continuing to connect some of those missing links between what you know and how to use that knowledge. Thank you for downloading the missing link for SLP's podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, I'd love you to subscribe, rate it, and leave a short review. Also, please share an episode with a friend. Together, we can raise awareness and help more SLPs find and connect those missing links and get the information needed to help them feel confident in their patient care every step of the way. Follow me on Instagram and join the Fresh SLP community on Facebook. Show notes are always available, so come learn more at freshslp.com. Let's make those connections. You got this.